towards a Heraclitian ethics. I'd like to present a condensed and summarized version of my understanding and appreciation of the Heraclitian lens as it pertains to the acquisition of eudaimonia and ataraxia. While my considerations are based upon a critical approach to Heraclitus' extant fragments and the attempts, both historical and modern, to interpret their true meaning, my project is not archaeological nor philological, and I do not propose to be illuminating the only correct account of the Ephesians' media ethical writings. What I am attempting is to use the conclusions I have reached about Heraclitus' worldview, which I believe to be both accurate and defensible, in order to illustrate the practical, sentimental, aesthetic, and ultimately prescriptive upshot of those conclusions. The obvious drawback to consulting Heraclitus is that, while he offers incredibly pregnant and perceptive signs, pointing the way towards some such physical, metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical theories, there is nevertheless nothing comprehensive or even remotely complete to draw upon. And so, in order to erect something properly useful upon his foundations, we must borrow building material from others. This tends to have manifested accordingly as the anachronistic projections upon the Ephesian of each subsequent interpreter's most convenient pet theories, finding the credibility of his ancient status to be an appropriate place to stress the germination of their correct and updated outlook. We find it in Hegel and Lasseler's dialectical abuses, and with cowardly Western mystics deliberately misinterpreting I sought for myself, not as the arrogant self-assertion of independence that it is, but as an inward subjectivism which the Ephesian clearly despises above all else. See the numerous relevant fragments disparaging the turn towards private worlds. We find it even as early as Cratylus's perversions. This mistake I will endeavour not to repeat. I wish to make it clear from the outset that I do not intend to thrust my own conceptions onto a man wholly innocent of their corrupting influence. I am merely learning from him while adapting his insights to my own context of knowledge, which is unavoidably eclectic. And while I do believe myself to be a Heraclitian at base, his philosophy is manifest here in a way Heraclitus would not approach even in a dream, much less could it be claimed he would come to endorse it, for two main reasons. First, I find myself in 21st century Australia, not circa 500 BCE or thesis. Second, I too have sought for myself, and could not be content with clinging to banal derivations against my own judgment and experience. Now, most indispensable for my own understanding of Heraclitus has been the works of C.S. Peirce, who it seems wholly neglected this Ionian in favour of an attenuated Platonism, but who nevertheless offers a phanoroscopy highly suited to the analysis of one for whom the division between subject and object was not so strong as our post-Christian, post-Cartesian culture tends to lead us, the children of the first world especially, to imagine is the most obvious and unavoidable fact. This notion is endlessly reinforced thanks to the wondrous successes of the physical sciences, most often following a reductive physicalism and thus choosing their side of the dualistic war. Meanwhile, competing philosophical interpretations have stagnated thanks to the subjective tendency which remains and will forever remain utterly anemic. Returning to Peirce, and to give but a clue in this direction, Heraclitus's inductive, naturalistic approach leads him to a clear perception of firstness and thirdness beyond the mere secondness of the hoi polloi. I found also a kindred spirit in the works of Walter Pater, a poet and aesthete rather than a philosopher, who nevertheless seems to be the only individual besides myself who has explicitly recognised and endorsed the consonance of Heraclitianism with Epicureanism. I am indebted to his evocative example. Finally, I would like to mention GTW Patrick's excellent introduction to and translation of the fragments, which have served as a guide for my own conception. With these preliminary considerations out of the way, I'll discuss some important aspects of Heraclitus which suggest the shape of an ethical attitude. Foremost, we have the flux theory, for which Heraclitus is both most well-known and least understood. The essential characteristic is not to be taken with the corrosive instability which Pantare too readily suggests, but instead as the ultimate perishability of all compound phenomena, or else their active impermanence rather than ceaseless transformations per se. Everything flows should not suggest that all is coming to be and passing away in the same way or at the same rate, but rather to note that all things, given enough time, will change around and are indeed in the process. What does this say about identity? As the river analogy should properly suggest, change is actually a crucial aspect of identity, and this is particularly evident for organisms which are in a continual self-sustaining process, dynamic and consumptive. Like the river, this activity defines their existence. Important for our considerations are the implications for presentism, adaptability, and mortality. We, each one of us, daily consumes fire. In the plants we eat due to photosynthesis, and in the animals which feed upon those plants, our very life energy is assuredly the effluence of our star. 
Our bodies and minds are accrued over time and must eventually be returned. While here, though, we should appreciate forms as they appear, knowing that every flower wilts, every loved one perishes, and every opportunity once missed is gone forever. Even so, our elements will be recycled to dance the two-step again, but it will not be ours to experience it. Metabolism is in fact a universal process for Heraclitus, boldly exemplified by the ever-living fire, and our hylozoic world bears witness to continual ch exchanges of fire for all things, as where well is their exchange for gold, in both the upward and downward roads out from which the one, craving, becomes myriad things, and satiated, dissolves once again. This movement is bipolar. Heraclitus notes the palantropic reflexive harmony sustained by the opposite tensions of warring qualities, such as light and dark, wet and dry. The one cannot exist without the other. The privation of the former just is the domination of the later. We should not at all be surprised to find that our own organism perceives in just this way. And indeed, all sensory information operates on a continuum, the extremes of which bear feelings the polar opposite of one another. The human body is a microcosmos, part of the universe just as much as anything else, and for that very reason, attuned to its laws. We should therefore find nothing surprising in our logical faculty, our ability to understand regularity amidst changes, a constancy which is nothing other than measurement and ratio, the mathematical relationships of give and take. How could beings evolve within such a cosmos, else their own constitution was a direct reflection of this selfsame process? There is nothing supernatural about the mind. It is nothing other than a constituent element of the manifest universe, reflecting the rationality that it swims within, like a fish in water, scarcely aware of this logos all around and inside its own body. So complete is the saturation. Hence, most men are ignorant, asserts Heraclitus. They see things, to be sure, and yet do not awaken to the connections between them to the laws that underlie them, to the natural accounts to be given of them. They turn aside into worlds of their own, towards private understanding, erecting their own fancies and living inside them as though sleepwalking through life, seeing the world not as it was, is, and forever shall be, but as they merely imagine it to be. No true perception, no voice of reason, can penetrate this wall of fables unless a man chooses to meet the world himself, to shine his dry light upon it with full focused attention. This is what wisdom consists of, it is the clearest apprehension of Logos, this imminent unity among ceaseless activity. If this Logos be named God, though both answering and not answering to that name, then we best conceive of a feeling God rather than a cognizing one, a hylopathism rather than a panpsychism. This God everywhere is but the eye of a snail, suspended upon its slender stalk, seeking, meeting resistance and slinking backwards, unfolding once more to search again. A God who loves, a God who hates, building and destroying a child playing draughts, God and devil at once. What are men to do? Awaken. Meet the world as a dynamic whole, alive and evolving, of which the dry flame and the lightning bolt guiding things are but the correlate images of vital energy, warm breath exhaled and inhaled daily. The universe is alive and so are you. The basic differences amongst men ultimately comes down to the quality of their awareness, the openness and attentiveness to reality as it unfolds around them as opposed to preoccupations with dreams, fears, wishes, and distractions. How are men to live? As the cosmos does, dynamically and vitally, through wisdom and self-control, and with balanced comprehension of the unity of opposites, both internal and external. We have an emotional apparatus which fuels alike passions and relaxation, of all sorts. We must judge the correct measure of our responses. Burn bright and flame-like. Habituation is stiff death to mind. It is calcification. As the predictable nature of a rock marks narrow possibilities for its activity, just so, habit induces reflex rather than response, makes a human unable to adapt. Such is virtue when elevated to an idea, not considered an instrument for response, not regarded as a toolbox to be consulted when each occasion arises, but elevated to codification as an unchanging inscription upon the soul, thou shalt not. Virtue should quite rightly belong to those who show the repeated ability to respond appropriately as the occasion demands, not unfailingly resorting to rote rules and casuistry. A man's character is his demon. What does yours look like? We are alive, but only for a time. In this organism of ours, unlike the uncaring universe, things are good and evil. Those things which agree with our being are good, those which disagree are evil. We meet these in pleasure and pain, respectively. This is a relative valuation, to be sure, but all manifest qualities are relative. We are not ourselves universes, so for what should we care about its perfect justice? manifest equally in conquest and defeat. We are individual organisms. Nature, to be commanded, must indeed be obeyed, but persuaded she must be. It is paramount, therefore, to understand her rules. 
Fight for your life and enjoy it, not as a profligate does, but with the cool self-assurance of one who understands wisdom and lives it, who knows what he needs is easy to obtain, and having obtained it, is satisfied. Our natural needs are simple. Fate is negligible, necessity is comprehensible. We are free to slither along our bellies in the mud like snakes, or drift with our heads in the clouds, and many do, or we can stand upon our own two feet and stride upon the earth as integrated beings. Reject not bodily pleasures in the pursuit of purity. A sound mind and a healthy body are two sides of the same coin, but do not be a slave to your desires either. Embrace your full constitution, body and soul, and live well.